I am still working my way through my top 100 images for my little photo book project. So let's dive in and have a look at another process. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 146 of Understanding Darktable. For this one, we're diving back to an image I took about eight years ago on a group shoot that I organized in Sydney. I found a couple of models, in, actually the female I'd shot with before, Taylor, and the guy I had not shot with before. And the idea with this shot was, or with this whole shoot, was we were going for a film noir kind of look. So we're thinking that sort of, you know, 40s, gangster, private investigator kind of look. And the intent was always to process for a fairly high contrast black and white kind of look. So this is the raw file. I have reset it, named it Darktable 4.8.1. And this is where we're starting from. As I look at this image now, I do think I probably underexposed a little more than I would be happy with today. I was okay with it at the time that I shot it, but in retrospect, I probably should have had an extra stop of light in the exposure, but it is what it is. So white balance, D65, highlight reconstruction we don't need because there's absolutely nothing clipped in this image. The mosaic is all good, orientation's good, exposure. Because I'm doing Filmic RGB as my tone mapper, and as I've explained before, Aurelian said, if you're using Filmic RGB, you really just want to get your mid-tones where they need to be. So we will drag our exposure up till we get our mid-tones to... Ooh. Well, given that we're going for a film noir kind of look, we can probably be a little bit on the dark side. But I'm, I'm thinking somewhere there, let's go two stops just for round numbers, shall we? We're happy with our midtones. As we can see, we're still nowhere near clipping our highlights here, so it's going to be good. Input color profile, we don't need to touch. Color calibration. I have a little preset here for black and white conversions where the various channels are set at 39, 50, and 11. That was something I picked up from a video from the Affinity Revolution channel uh, ages ago, and I still use it occasionally. I don't know if there's really any benefit to those numbers, but apparently there was some historical relevance to those values of 0.39 on the red channel, 0.5 on the green channel, and 0.11 on the blue channel. Give it a go. Your mileage may vary. But anyway, I'm using that as my starting point for my black and white conversion. And then of course we've got filmic RGB. Beyond that, what else do I want to do with this image? I probably want to clean up all these white marks that were on this wall in the background. So for that, I would go over to retouch and I will zoom right in over here. And I'm probably going to use the brush because a lot of that is fairly straight lines. I'm going to hit, ah, Team on, one of these days, people, one of these days, but today is not that day. All right, so I'm gonna control click the paintbrush so that it will keep on giving me the brush tool without me having to go back and select it after every stroke. And we're just gonna do something like that. And now I am gonna to have to leave the tool because I want to come over to here and change the source point, which I should have done before I started painting. And to do that, let's control click that again. Let's suppose I wanted to get this little mark down here and I think to myself, well, my because of the angle of that little mark on the wall, and we can see where my source point is, it's a little bit to the southeast of where the cursor is, and that's really not where I want it to be. I want my source point to be out here. What we can do is hit the shift key and one left click, and that will reposition our source for us. And now we can do our little bit of a retouch and that got rid of the bit that we wanted to get rid of. So now if I come up to here, rather than sampling from out to the right of my cursor, I actually want to sample from down below. So I will shift click and now I can do something like that. 
It's a bit wobbly, but it did the job. So that's a quick way to reposition the source for the retouch module. So let's just do that again. We'll go down to there. Just going to make that a little bit bigger and we'll draw up over there. And that might actually still be a bit of a problem. Yeah, it was. Thought it would be. So I'm just going to drag the source down a little bit lower so that it cleans that up. And we will go control click, grab our paintbrush again and can we go shift and click up to there I can make that a little bit smaller do something like that that's good I'm not going to worry about those they're fairly minor and they just kind of add to the texture of the wall without it being too intrusive I'll see how I feel later on when I'm zoomed out and I'm looking at the entire image I might then decide I want to come back and redo that those little bits there just above his hat we're going to visit those a bit later with the path tool rather than the brush tool. Uh, this one we will just do a little bit like so. That one there, I think we will probably use the path tool as well. But this little bit here we can do with the brush. That's all good. That's all good. Over to there. Then we'll just resample and do that bit. And then we'll move across a little bit more. This one will come up above and we'll go a little bit bigger with the brush. Something like that. And of course I went a bit too low, didn't I? Let's just go up to there. Turn the paths off. Control click our brush. And again, just paint across that like so. And another little bit there and that bit there and then maybe that bit there all right and it looks like I've got a little bit of dirt on my sensor so we will just clean up these few little bits while we're here as well I'm assuming it was dirt on the sensor it might have been marks on the wall I don't really know that's where we're at at the moment so now we'll go and grab our path tool and again we can do the shift and left click to reset our source if we want to so i'll set it right up there and we'll just go all the way around this like so and that's cleared up that patch and let's just zoom out yeah that little bit there I i'm thinking I'm okay with that. I'm going to leave that, but yes, this bit above his hat we definitely want to get rid of. So I'm going to control zoom so I can go past 100% zoom and just zoom in like so. And now I will grab the path tool and I'll just set my source up there and come right down the line of his hat and around that like so. Now, the issue here is we're getting all of this bleed from his hat. And the reason for that is because of the amount of feather along that bottom side of that path. So I could just narrow the feather for the entire path, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do it on a point by point basis to bring it in like so, so that we are not sampling from within his hat and then that should get us out of trouble not quite okay might just have to lift that point up a little bit and that one up a little bit and we probably just need to lift that one up a little bit oh i gotta go a bit higher on that one as well oh that was uh obviously closer to the uh, the hat than I realized. I think what we're starting to see now is the white that we're trying to get rid of is leaking in there. But to be honest, once you're zoomed out to a full view, oh, oh, whoa, okay, that was weird. That is really weird. When it's at full view, like I'm fully zoomed out to fit, 
what I'm seeing there is a little bit of that potential masking of the hat, but when I zoom into 100%, it disappears. Whoa, that's a bug because that affects my ability to process the rest of the image if I'm constantly being tricked into thinking that there is this, you know, dark shadow above his hat when in actual fact there isn't. If I zoom into 100%, it goes away, but at full zoom, it comes back. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, I might have to uh, open a, a ticket with that one because that's that's a little bit problematic. I mean, I can live with it. I can deal with it. I know that it's there. I know it's an issue, but that could potentially worry a new user who was not familiar with the program. Uh, and to be honest, it shouldn't do it. It should actually give me that view when I'm zoomed out. Uh, let's just see, can I do anything else? If I move that all away just a little bit and zoom out to 100%, now it's behaving itself. But I now do still see that little bit of a white splotch on the wall, which uh, not ideal, but I can live with it. In terms of contrast, I actually feel like there's already enough. We've got no detail down in this bottom right hand corner. And I think, you know, that is a maybe a failing in the way I shot this, or maybe I was comfortable with it at the time because I knew I was going for a film noir look and you do tend to crush all the shadows in film noir. So I don't think I want to crush the shadows any further. And I don't know if I want to push the highlights right up anyway. Let's just try color balance RGB and we'll boost the highlights with some brilliance. Yeah, that kind of works. It's not looking overcooked. We've still got detail in Taylor's face. Yeah, I'm thinking that's about as far as I want to take the, the contrast. Midtones I shouldn't need to touch because the whole point at the beginning of this exercise was we use the exposure slider to get our midtones to where they wanted to be. So I really should have no reason for touching the midtones slider in the brilliance grading. And in terms of the shadows, I could try lifting things up, but then yeah, I feel like we're getting away from film noir, like we're losing that high contrast look. And I certainly, I don't think I want to crush it any further. Just to experiment with that. Yeah, I feel like we're losing too much detail down here, we're losing her shoes. I think I'm just going to leave it at that with a little bit of a boost for the highlights and nothing else. In terms of crop, I'm just going to leave it at the full image. There's no reason for me to crop this any tighter. In hindsight, kind of wish I'd shot it a little wider so that I could have cropped a 16x9 version of it. Uh, if I did try to do a 16x9 crop of this, just to show you what I'm talking about here, I can just get away with it. I can just get away with it. I've got her shoes in the bottom of the frame. I've got the top of his hat in the top of the frame. So, so maybe I didn't do too bad with the, the way I shot it. But in terms of this image, I'm actually going to leave it uncropped for the photo book and leave it there. Do I want to split tone it? Yeah, maybe. And I'll use the color balance RGB module for that. So we'll go to the four ways tab. In terms of tones or hues for that split tone, I'm thinking dark browns for the shadows. So our shadows are the second set of sliders. I have to say, I don't know if I've said this before, but I really hate the graphical design of the color balance RGB four ways tab, because this thin white line under global offset makes me think that these three sliders pertain to the shadows lift and that these three sliders pertain to the highlights gain and that the next three pertain to power. And then it's like, oh, hang on, but what are the bottom three? Oh, 
that thin white line needs to be in between the chroma slider and the title of the next section. Just a pet peeve of mine. Uh, if you are the developer who developed the color balance RGB module, could you please change that? Because it is annoying to me. <laughs> it's annoying to me. Okay, I'm, I'm pleading for something that only affects me. I don't know. Maybe you feel the same way. Sing out in the comments if you do. All right, so the shadows. We're going to go with some sort of dark brown, deep red kind of look. So hue, we probably want somewhere about there. And we'll just bring it up to, yeah, somewhere there. We're sort of going for a bit of a sepia look here, aren't we? And the highlights, I'm thinking yellowish to make it look like an old print that's sort of faded with time. I want to go, let's go silly just so I can really see that. And then we'll just back that off. Yeah, I'm thinking somewhere about there. So without it, got our monochrome with it. We've got our tones, but we've also got the brilliance increase. Maybe I should have, should have done that in two separate modules of color balance RGB, but we've killed two birds with one stone. Let's compress our history stack. We should do some sharpening, shouldn't we? Okay, so contrast equalizer for that and my sharpening. And with this, I am just going to do a very quick and dirty drawn path around something like that. So it really doesn't need to go all the way out over her shoes because they're not a main part of the composition. I don't think it's going to matter if they are not sharpened. I could if I wanted to, yeah, simply just drag it out like that, but I don't think we really need it. But that will uh, give us sharpening across there. I might just increase the feather a little bit just because I don't like the sharpening to fall off too rapidly. I find if, if there's a bit of a wide transition it becomes less noticeable that you did some sharpening. All right so let's zoom in on that at 100% have a look at it take the sharpening off yep so we can certainly see it's doing some stuff. I do feel in this instance that the sharpening that I'm doing with the contrast equalizer is applying what looks like grain to the areas of just coarse detail in the image. Like if I turn that off, you can see his pants become much smoother. This bit of wall in under his leg becomes smoother. You can see it up here to the left of his arm. See, it gets a bit grainy, gritty looking. So I'm wondering... Do we be a little more discerning about where we have the path? Let's just turn that on. Let's bring this right down. Let's bring this right in like so. I might leave that area there. I'll, I'll just live with the, the graininess in that area underneath his leg. And we'll bring this right down to here, add another node, bring this right into there. And now let's have a look at that. I suppose I haven't really changed what it's doing to his suit, have I? Because I've still got his suit in the part of the image that's being sharpened. Now I'm thinking more about it. I'm kind of thinking, well, if we're going for a film noir look, grain was not necessarily a bad thing. So maybe... Maybe it's okay where it is. So without and with. All right, I think I'm going to leave that image there. Uh, questions, comments, sing out down below. And uh, if you are a new Darktable user, might I suggest you check out these couple of videos. First one is all about how to process raw files in Darktable, some of which you've just seen me do. And the other one is a video all about the new features in Darktable 4.8, which at the time of recording is the current version. All right, I will catch you in the next one.